I, I just to let me know, um, I've spoken to this group before. Uh, how many of you have heard me talk to this group before? Okay. Well, you know there's going to be a little overlap here. Won't be the same, but overlap. Because this is my favorite lecture, and how could I not give my favorite lecture? But it'll be, it'll be different. Um, so I am a complete architecture junkie. I have been loving on architecture literally since I was a little bitty kid. I don't know what got into me, but I just like loved buildings from the time I was a little bitty kid. And I would insist that my parents take us on vacation to these buildings I'd found in pictures and because I, I just I wanted to see them. And I keep thinking that at some point I'm going to burn out. I've been doing this a long time, uh, but I don't burn out. It just gets, I just never get tired of looking at architecture and thinking about architecture and talking about architecture and teaching architecture and making architecture. It's, uh, it's an incredibly fascinating field for me. Now, I've been teaching a class at UT for a long time called Architecture and Society. And in that class, I am not only a junkie, but I'm a pusher. I'm trying to get all these kids excited about and enthusiastic about architecture because I actually think architecture can make lives better. It can be a significant force in all of our lives, in enriching our life and making it better. So in that class, and now I've had, this is hard to believe, 25,000 UT students have taken that class. We teach 420 every semester. And it's a very popular class on campus. And uh, I make a lot of junkies in that class. Um, and I'm proud to say it. Uh, I got an email from a woman yesterday who was in my class two years ago, and she and her family were going to see Grandma in Missouri, and she made them detour around and go to Bentonville, Arkansas, and see the new Crystal Bridges Museum there, which we'd seen in class. And she said, I just I gotta see that building. So they spent half a day there, and she is help working on making her parents junkies now, uh, because it's, it's infectious. So why do I think this is something that's so important and that makes lives better? I, I say in the first lecture of that class that architecture is a physical embodiment of who we are as individuals and who we are collectively as a society. It really is a reflection of who we are as individuals and who we are collectively as a culture. Um, and the example I give to those students is, so let's imagine that you get assigned as a freshman to a dorm room in Jester. And let's say UT had an extremely liberal policy about renovation of your dorm room, and you could do anything you wanted to it. They don't, believe me, but let's imagine that. And so let's say you moved into that Jester dorm room, and you painted every surface of it black, jet black, and you uh, found a fantastic uh, zebra skin rug that you put on the floor, and you found a really great zebra pattern bedspread that you put on the bed, and then you got one of those disco balls with all the little mirrors, and you shone lights on it, and you put a blackout curtain in that little prison window they have in, in Jester, and you made the whole thing completely black, and then you shot that disco light on there, and, uh, and then when I opened the door and greeted you in your room, I would get an impression of who you are. <laughs> I would. I couldn't help it. I would think something about who you were because architecture is a physical embodiment of who we are as individuals, and we read it that way all the time. If, in contrast, you moved into that same dorm room and you painted it Pepto-Bismol pink, and you put a beautiful white uh, lace um, bedspread on the bed, and you had matching white lace curtains on the window, and you put a little poster board up, and you put your corsages from the prom, <laughs> and your pictures of all your friends, and on the bed you put every single stuffed animal you've ever had in your entire life on the bed, and I opened the door and I came into your room, I would get an impression 
of who you were. Because architecture is a physical embodiment of who we are as individuals. Now, let's take it a little bigger scale. Let's say those same kids graduate from UT and they go out in the world for their first job and their first location. And let's say you might go to Lockhart, Texas, uh, 30 miles or so away from here, sweet little town. Let's say you got a, got a job teaching school there. Uh, you were fortunate enough to uh, you know, be able to rent a little bungalow house just a few blocks from the square. Big pecan trees in the yard. Uh, plenty of yard that you could grow a little garden and uh, raise some fruits and vegetables and some flowers. Uh, maybe there's a nice front porch on that bungalow house and you sit out in that porch swing and you do your email out there and, and people walk by in the front with their dogs and their kids and you get to know the neighbors and you can walk down the street to church and you can even walk down the street to the elementary school where you teach. Uh, and every morning you wake up and you hear the birds singing in the trees. And, and let's say you live in that little bungalow house in Lockhart, Texas for 10 years. It's going to have an impact on who you are. It's going gonna, it's gonna to shape who you are. Let's say in contrast, take that same kid and let's say they made the decision to move to Brooklyn in New York. And uh, you move to this neighborhood called Flatbush, and uh, it's uh, converting now from factory buildings into housing. And uh, so let's say you're on the fourth floor of a walk up. You walk up four floors. It used to be an industrial building. It's kind of illegal for it to be housing, but it's been converted into housing because there's big demand for that there. Every hipster in the world wants to live in Brooklyn. Uh, and so you're up on that top floor and it is so rudimentary. You've got this tiny, tiny little space. You've barely got a, a hot plate to cook on. Uh, you, you know, you just, you know, the bedroom is only big enough for the bed and that's all. Uh, you can't have any friends over or anything. Uh, you wake up every morning and you hear the garbage truck emptying the dumpster and the factory buildings getting warmed up and getting revving at 6 a.m. every morning. Uh, you walk out the street and it's anonymous New York. Geez, no one knows who you are. You don't know who anyone is. Uh, but it's a big, exciting, vital, vibrant city. And uh, let's say you live there for 10 years. And it's going to have an effect on who you are. The difference between living in that bungalow in Lockhart, Texas, and living in that walk up in Brooklyn is gonna shape who you are, how you think, what kind of friends you make, what kind of, uh, uh, how you sleep. Uh, everything is shaped by the physical environment we live in. Now, I sincerely, sincerely believe this is so important. Now, you know, you can take a, an art appreciation class at UT, and I, recommend that, but you know, you can be interested in art or not be interested in art and you know, that's a choice. You can take a music appreciation class and you can be interested in music or you can not be interested in music and I don't think it makes a huge difference. But you will freaking be a part of architecture every minute of your life and either you can know something about that or you can be but ignorant about that. and live your life without kind of a consciousness of the impact that architecture has, because it does have a really big impact. Now, uh, so I always love it when somebody who is super important and famous, they say something I agree with anyway. Uh, and so in this case, I'm going to quote from Winston Churchill. It doesn't get any better than Winston Churchill. He's the best person ever to quote from. And he was someone who understood architecture and understood the power of architecture, quite an architecture aficionado himself. And he said in a speech to Parliament after World War II, they'd had devastating bombing in London. That beautiful city was in shambles. Uh, they were talking about the rebuilding of London. And in that speech to Parliament, he said, we have got to invest. In this case, it was in rebuilding the Parliament building. We've got to invest in this because he said, we shape our buildings, thereafter our buildings shape us. We shape our buildings, thereafter our buildings shape us. 
And I believe that. And so this is something that's hugely consequential. Now, why is it, if this is so important, why is it that we don't talk about this more? This isn't more a part of our education, our uh, political discourse. Uh, and I think there's a, a, a pretty good reason for that. Because the impact that architecture has is not nearly as potent overtly as it is covertly. It is something that works on us subliminally, unconsciously. It works when we're not even thinking about it. So this room is a good example right now. You spent, you've spent a lot of time in this room over the last day or two, and you know, it would be a completely different thing if you didn't have all those beautiful trees right out there. Honestly, you would get tired faster if all of this were completely closed and there were no natural light and there was no view to nature because that view to nature and that natural light, it's refreshing to us. Uh, if this were a lecture auditorium where all of you were in raked seats and in rows and let's say there was a podium up here and there were no steps and I couldn't get down to you, so I'm up here all the time and I'm preaching to you like this, we would have a different relationship. You would have a different sense of the message that you're getting here than if it's flat floor, I can walk around, you're at tables, you have this beautiful, the room is making a difference in the kind of communication we have. And that happens, are you conscious of that? No, you didn't come in here this morning and say, thank goodness this room has a flat floor because the speaker can walk around instead of you know, having to stay up on a podium. Or you didn't say, I'm gonna, wow, it would be so hard for me to sit here all day if I didn't have those beautiful trees to look at. I feel so much better because they're there. These are things that happen to us unconsciously. There's a, uh, a really great neuroscientist, David Eagleman. Some of you have probably read his book, Incognito. And in that book, he makes the argument that 90% of our experience and what our brain does neuro neurologically is unconscious behavior. Our, we're, what we do is a whole lot generated by unconscious behavior. If you go out there and try to ride a bicycle and really think about, I'm gonna press this foot and then I'm gonna press this foot and I'm gonna turn, you'll crash. You can't do it. Your brain is just made so that those things have to just become automatic. And honestly, whether or not you put chocolate chips on your ice cream uh, at the break or whether you didn't, you might not even have thought about it. You might have just piled those things on unconsciously and piled on those calories unconscious. I, we do it all the time. A lot of our lives is just these, they're, it's hu hugely impacted by these things that are unconscious behavior. And that's where architecture lives. It lives in that unconscious behavior. You're not thinking about it, but it's having a big impact on your behavior, on your mood, uh, on whether you're happy or whether you're depressed. Uh, it can make a big difference in, in, in an unconscious way. And now there's social scientists who've really worked on that. There's a guy named uh, Roger Ulrich who looked at hospitals. And he found a hospital that had a corridor down the center. It had identical rooms on either side of the corridor. But on one side of the corridor, the rooms looked into beautiful nature views, a little park, a place where kids played down there. And in the other direction, it looked 20 feet away into a solid brick wall. And he was interested, is there a difference in the way people heal on one side of that corridor or the other side of the corridor. So they measured for people with very comparable illnesses. They measured how long they stayed in the hospital, how much they requested pain medication. Uh, and they found that on the side with the views to nature, people got well faster and left the hospital faster and they requested less pain medication for comparable illnesses and comparable situations. The only difference there was the physical environment. Now, did those doctors and those nurses and those patients think, oh, I'm, I want to be on this side of the corridor because I'll heal faster? No. It was unconscious. They were not conscious of the impact that that light and that view had, but it did have an impact whether they're conscious of it or not. Uh, there's a woman named Lisa Heeshong that studied 
school environments. And she just looks at natural light. Uh, and so she looked at little kids' schools, elementary schools that had no windows, uh, elementary schools that had little tiny windows, elementary schools that had normal size windows, schools that had floor to ceiling glass, schools that had floor to ceiling glass and a skylight. And she just looked at test scores. Well, how much do test scores improve in the rooms without natural light and the rooms with abundant natural light? And the scores in both math and reading improved much more in the rooms that had abundant natural light. And there's a physiological reason for that, because our bodies produce serotonin in direct relation to the amount of natural light we're exposed to. If we're exposed to more natural light, we get more serotonin production, less natural light, less serotonin production. And serotonin is a neurotransmitter. It's what helps us make neuronal connections in our brain. It's uh, essentially, it's the same thing as Ritalin. It gives you better attentiveness. Uh, so it's no wonder that those kids in those classes where the kids' serotonin is just pumped up uh, versus the kids that have no serotonin production, of course they learn better. But is that teacher conscious of, man, my kids are going to really suck this year because I don't have any natural light. If I don't have any natural light, they're not going to have any serotonin. If they don't have any serotonin, they can't learn. Uh, no, that's all unconscious. But that doesn't mean it's not really, really powerful and effective. So what I'm saying is a lot of times this, the power of architecture is not you looking at architecture it's the architecture working on you when you're not paying any attention at all. But it is this big unconscious impact. So I guess all this came home to me the very most when I was uh, in my 20s. Uh, I had a really good friend, my best friend for life. Uh, st he's still my best friend. Uh, he and I are going on a trip together in a couple of weeks, uh, we, once a year, we have our little pilgrimage together. We've never lived in the same city as adults, but we still get together on a regular basis because we're best buddies. Uh, so I grew up with him. Uh, he was at Harvard Law School during the time I was at MIT studying architecture. And uh, so we had that overlap as graduate students. Uh, and then he moved to Washington, DC, and I stayed in Boston to teach at MIT. And um, so he'd been down in Washington, I don't know, six weeks or so. And he called me up and said, Larry, I don't, I don't get it. I am totally depressed. I can barely get out of bed in the morning. And it makes no sense at all because my job is just what I anticipated. It's great. I'm living in the city that is exactly the city I wanted to live in. You know, I mean, he's a political junkie and Washington's like, you know, dope for him. Uh, he said, I'm, I'm depressed, and I don't know what it is. Uh, so I talked to him on the phone a little while. Then a couple of weeks later, he calls me again, calls me again, and he just, he's depressed. And it's totally not like him. This is not the kind of guy he is. Uh, so I said, look, let me, let me drive down there and uh, stay for a week and try to cheer you up. So I drove down from Boston. Uh, went by his law firm, he gave me a key, uh, gave me the address of his place, I started to go to his place. As I'm driving to the place, I'm like, whoa, dude, this is a rough neighborhood. Uh, back then, Washington had some really rough neighborhoods, and it was scary. Uh, but I get out of my car, I go in, he's in a, a walk-up, three-story brownstone walk-up. Uh, so I open the front door, and immediately, ugh, smells like urine. The, the hallway was just ugh, nasty. He's on the third floor. I walk up to the third floor. I open his apartment door. And <clears throat> the landlord had completely painted his apartment before he moved in. But the way he painted it was to just take beige paint, and they just spray painted everything the walls, the floors, the woodwork, everything, the door handle, the hardware on the doors, the kitchen cabinets. I'd never seen anybody 
paint anything so badly in my life, but just, and that was just the attitude, okay? We painted it, it's painted. Uh, he's still got a mattress sitting on the floor. He's been there three months. He's still got a mattress on the floor. His books are in boxes and he's like camping out there. So he comes home in a little while and I said, it's no surprise to me you're depressed. You live in a really depressing place. You got to get out of this place or fix it up or do something because this is super depressing. And he said, Larry, that's just you being an architect. It is not important. Uh, I don't spend any time here anyway. I work all the time. You know, it, it really doesn't matter. I, it's just a crash pad. And uh, okay, okay, whatever. So I spend the weekend with him, go back to Boston. I keep hearing the report. I'm depressed. I'm depressed. So finally, I said, look, you've got a six-month lease on that place. It's about to run out. I'm going to come down for the weekend. We're going to find you a better place to live. And, you know, what have you got to lose? Try it, because nothing else is working. So I go down there, and we look around, and we see he thought he was still a poor college student. But no, now he's a rich lawyer, so he can afford a little more <laughs> lease money. So I've, you know, twisted his arm and, okay, well, we'll pay a little more in rent. And uh, so we found this really great little uh, better neighborhood and uh, ground floor unit where it's spilled out on a patio in the back, big tree in the brick patio in the living room, dining room, kitchen all, you know, opened out through glass to this beautiful little backyard. Uh, and we went out and bought him some furniture. I bought him a chaise lounge. I thought he was gonna you know, cry when he wrote the check for that because <laughs> it was expensive, but I, you know, this is a good investment. He still got that chaise lounge, by the way. <laughs> so you know, he buys his chaise lounge. We bought some plants and some pictures to put on the wall. We fixed it up a little bit, and I went back to Boston. I don't know, maybe two weeks later, he calls me on a Sunday, and he said, man, I had a great day today. Uh, you know, there's that little tennis court in that park a couple of blocks from my house. Well, some of the guys from the office and I went over there and we played doubles tennis this morning. And, you know, it was a beautiful day. It was, it was great. We had a lot of fun. Uh, then we came back and, you know, there's a little bakery on the corner just a block away from my house. We picked up some croissants and some orange juice and we came and we sat out on the table that you forced me to buy in my backyard and we sat there and had our croissants and orange juice and talked politics and then we came inside in the afternoon and watched the Redskins game and uh, you know read the Washington Post and oh man it was a great day and I, you know, I'm feeling better I'm feeling better I'm not as depressed as I was he said you stupid I mean Harvard what did they what did you know nothing you don't even know how to manage your life you have to have a decent place to live or you're going to freaking be depressed. And when he got a decent place to live, everything was okay. Now that's a lesson all of us need to know. Architecture can make your life better or it can make your life suck. Uh, and it's something all of us need to know about. And I'm on a mission with UT college students and I've got 25,000 of them under my belt of helping them learn how to live their lives better by using architecture as a way to enhance it. Now I'm gonna just go through quickly uh, a few examples and I'm gonna use examples, I'm not, I'm not embarrassed to tell you, I'm gonna use examples of buildings we've done uh, in my practice because I know about them and I know about how I, I, I keep up with them, the clients and the people who live and work and, and so I can tell you, all right, what difference does this make or not make in people's lives? And we're going to go, just let's think first about places where you work. How can you make a place where you work better? How can your work be fun instead of a drudgery? Because maybe the place helps that happen. So this is a tiny little office building that we did for an engineering firm here in Austin. And these are engineers we work with all the time. They're the best. These are super smart engineers, most of them UT grads, half of them took my class way back 20 years ago uh, when they were undergrads at UT. And, uh, but they have a great little engineering practice now. And when they started to build their little office building, they said, instead of just building your generic dumb, we're gonna make an office building that really works for us. 
Now these guys, what they're really experts at is concrete. They know concrete better than anyone. And people consult with them all over the world for their expertise in concrete. So we said from the beginning, okay, we're gonna make about concrete. And they're like, yes, concrete, love it, yes. Uh, so these walls are just concrete. They are unreinforced concrete. There's no rebar in there. Those things are 20 inches deep. Uh, and if you, if you make that much concrete, it, it isn't, concrete is not a great insulator, but it has some insulation value. Uh, but it has very good high thermal mass. And that can be a very energy efficient way to keep a building thermally stable, is to have high thermal mass like the concrete. It's like being in a cave. So we were, and, and we, they did all their analysis on dew point and you know, how it was gonna behave and thermal, and, and, we, and they did their homework, we did our homework, and we made these, because we couldn't afford normal reinforced concrete. That actually is very labor intensive because you have to lay the rebar cage and pour the concrete around it. And, but if you're just doing mud, just pour it in a box, it's a lot less expensive. So this was the same price as just stud wall and brick veneer. Uh, so we had to get it very economical for them, so we did that. Uh, it's in a very nondescript location out in Loopland in Austin, but adjacent to it is a preserve that will always be nature. So on the back side, we could open up porches and decks and let them just, you know, have their lunch outside, have their meetings outside, do their email outside so that they could be indoors, outdoors and take advantage of that. These are pickup kind of guys. I mean, just to give you a sense, these are engineers. Uh, they got their pocket protectors and, well, maybe, maybe not quite that bad, but they are, they're rough and ready guys. They never wear anything but blue jeans to work. And so it's a, it's a rough and ready, tough kind of building. And it's all about being relaxed and informal. It's about always looking out, as you see on the right, to that preserve. All the rooms have these beautiful views out to the trees, lots of natural light in there, and lots of concrete uh, inside and outside, and, and just really reveling in that material that they, that's their science. And we even made little niches in the, some of the concrete walls, and they could put the artifacts of some of the engineering projects they've worked on, some of the materials they've analyzed, and those kind of landmark projects that they've been a part of. But in general, it's just a good, open, relaxed, collaborative place to work, and they love working there. They bring their kids up on the weekend, and the kids play out on the deck and in the preserve behind. Uh, they have parties there. If their house isn't big enough, they just have their party at the office, and, and they're, because it's a cool place to have a party. And now their, their company has grown so much, they've only been in there about five years, but their company's grown so much, they're asking us to double it. So we're doing an addition to their place right now. That makes every day of their life better. The place where they were versus the new place where they work, every one of them there would tell you, it's a world of difference in my work life. I enjoy working so much more. I know my colleagues more. I enjoy being with them more. It's almost like I'm going to a party, you know, because it's a, it's a nice place and it's a great group of people and we get a lot of work done, but we also, we really enjoy ourselves there. And uh, it makes a difference. Another workplace. This is a federal courthouse in Alpine, Texas. Anybody here from that area? Well, kind of one person timidly raised a hand in the back. Must mean they're from like Odessa or something. Uh, so this is, I love, love this area. Uh, beautiful, uh, you know, Pecos uh, region and just gorgeous landscape. And we used that red sandstone that's out there and, and used it in the building uh, and you know, tried to make a, play, a, a building that was very much of its, its place. Uh, and wonderful climate there, you get in the shade and it's, it's just pleasant all year round except maybe a little bit in July. Uh, but um, in particular, we were interested in what does it feel like to be in a court in West Texas? Um, and there's a woman there who is a lawyer, uh, who this is her workplace. This is 90% of her cases are tried here. And she told me several years after the building was opened, 
that this building just made such a difference in the work that goes on in that federal courthouse. Because most of those cases there are either drug cases or they're immigration cases. And these are very emotionally charged cases. And often it will involve whole families that are brought in there. And so you don't, you're not just trying an individual, you often will have, you know, 15 family members that are there as well. And sometimes it gets very emotional and very contentious. And she said, in our old courtroom, there were a lot of times when there was violence. You know, things bubbled up and, and you know, as a woman, she felt a little, ooh, a little vulnerable and, and uh, you know, it, it, it was tense. But she said, in the new courtroom, it never quite gets to that level. People feel a respect for what goes on here, because the building tells me this is a place where something important happens. There's a scale of the building. There are materials in the building that just give you, this is serious business. I, I can't just act like a renegade in this building. Uh, it's dignified. Uh, it's a, something about the acoustics in the building, she said. You know, but, uh, it was intentionally a way of trying to make this feel like uh, a place of authority, a place of dignity, a place you would respect so that your behavior would be a little bit different out here. Again, all on an unconscious level. And I think that's work there. Uh, a third workplace. This, is a, this has been such a joy to work on this project. This is. Uh, the Brain Performance Institute at uh, University of Texas at Dallas. It's right on Mockingbird in Dallas, near Love Field. So if you drive by, you kind of can't miss it. Uh, but this is a place where a bunch of neuroscientists, they do their research in the building next door. And this is a building where they, their clinical building, where they do brain performance training. Uh, they treat pa patients with uh, ADHD. They, they don't call them patients, sorry, got to get that out of my vocabulary. They treat clients uh, who have, uh, you know, wounded warriors who have uh, brain injury, uh, NFL football players who have brain injury, um, you know. But in addition to that, just for ordinary people, how do you make your brain perform better? Just like how do you make your heart perform better? What can we do through lifestyle and diet and exercise to make our heart perform better? What can we do through all those things to make our brain perform better? Because it's an organ just like the heart. Fantastic, inspiring people. Part of it was about making this environment that had a psychological impact that you got, you had a feeling of quiet and a feeling of, uh, you know, uh, psychological calm that would be there. So there's a little garden as you approach, and the garden has this just kind of calm uh, quality to it. And then you move into this central space that is, and it's very hard to describe the acoustics of this space, but that's one of the things our client, Sandy Chapman, likes the best about this space is that you walk in, and it just, it's not like it's dead quiet, you know, you hear a little bit, but it's certainly not noisy. And there's a sense of just uh, calm when you come into that central space of the building. Uh, and then all over the building, there are connections back to the outdoors and the natural light. Natural light's a huge kind of calming thing there. Um, there are places where you can, you know, do yoga. There's a particular kind of yoga room. So there are things that, about body and mind and relationship of those things together. Uh, and then there's always just this sense of community around that central space. You see what's going on, you see your colleagues, you see your, your clients uh, coming and going through there, and there is a real sense of community that comes out of that. Uh, and then when you get down to your individual workspace, that we, we decided to have little tiny offices like this one on the left, just 10 feet by 10 feet, but then lots of collaboration spaces. So you walk out of your office and you meet a colleague and there are places for you to talk and, and that's really how they work the best. They need that hands down private space, but they also need these places where they can interact. Uh, but the design of the building has been all about, you know, helping them do their particular kind of work better. So I'm saying. Qualities is the engineering building. 
A, a lot of the same as the EERC. And that's a game-changing building on this campus yeah. that what the old engineering buildings were and what the new engineering building is, oh my gosh, <laughs> night and day. And that's, those guys that are in there, they'll tell you that. Yeah. Uh, and that's the kind of impact it can have, it can have on your work life. Okay, let's talk about living, homes, where we reside. Uh, in the intro, they talked about the Torcaso house. This is a house we did in Santa Fe. Uh, I'm going in a couple of weeks. The art museum has asked us to give a tour of that to some of their patrons. Uh, but this is a house that is in the most heavenly, beautiful landscape. Uh, near the top of a hill, not quite the top of a hill. Uh, there's beautiful uh, pinyon trees uh, all the way around it. We just nestled it in there. Uh, but then took advantage of these amazing views, just spectacular views of that northern New Mexico landscape. And then the building just opens up. It, 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 I mean, the whole reason for being here, this couple was from Dallas. They moved to Santa Fe because of this site and this view and this place. And they wanted to be a part of the landscape. So when you're in that living room, on one side you can open all that wall up for 40 feet and you just spill out onto a deck. On the other side, you're gonna open it up 20 feet and you spill out onto a courtyard. Uh, but it's, and the, the climate is such that for a lot of the year, uh, you can just open that whole place up and it's like you're living in the outdoors. Uh, lots and lots of spaces to be outside and off to the left here is this just endless view across to the mountains of northern Mexico and uh, just spectacular, breathtaking view. And you get the, the storms moving in and out, and you get the, uh, the sunrise and the sunset, and it's just, it's a, a spectacular connection to uh, the physical environment. And then the whole building is actually made out of uh, what's called rammed earth. It actually is dirt, I mean, uh, and it's the dirts that are around there, and they're these beautiful colors uh, in the soil there. We use four different colors of soil, and this is a very old traditional way of building uh, in the desert southwest. Uh, it's just as hard as concrete, and if you touch it, it would be like concrete, but it has all the textures and colors of northern New Mexico there. Uh, but this was about a lifestyle these people wanted to live, a lifestyle that had to do with connecting to nature, to landscape, to views, to sky. And that meant a respect for nature and landscape. And uh, this is super sustainable house, uh, very close to zero net energy. We have uh, solar collectors that power the house. Uh, it, it, is, it requires very little heating and cooling because it's oriented just the right way. It has all the right sun shading, all the right breeze and natural ventilation, uh, radiant heating in the floors. Uh, water collection uh, underneath these decks, there are huge tanks that collect every drop of water that falls on the site, and that's what irrigates everything around it. Just in every way, just as energy efficient and as green as it possibly could be. Rick Torcaso, on his smartphone, he can tell you what temperature it is in every room of his house and whether his air conditioner or his heater has been on in the past month and how much it used and what his solar farm is generating. Uh, so it's all smart, too. Uh, but it is a consistent attitude toward the landscape, toward nature, toward enjoyment of nature, built into the way Rick and Cynthia Torcaso live. At a totally other end of the spectrum, this is a, a student housing environment that we did uh, here on the UT campus, actually just off the campus, but on land owned by UT. Uh, and it's meant to be you know, lively and student-oriented. This is a uh, you know, young, contemporary kind of place. And uh, there were two things we were super interested in here. One is, how can we help these kids make friends? That's a huge thing to me about college. Uh, you need to make social contacts. You need to make a peer group. That's part of what going to college is learning, how to put yourself in a new environment and find a way to make a life and friends. And that's, that's a huge part. And, and also, I'll guarantee you, their grades are better if they have some friends and they have some people to study with and they, 
They feel at home instead of feeling uh, scared. And so there's lots of social spaces in the building to try to encourage that. You know, it's, it's student housing, tiny little rooms, but big views, fantastic views all of the campus and of downtown Austin. Uh, lots of study areas where they can, because another thing we're super interested in here is it's not meant to be just for nerds, but it is meant to be a serious study environment. This is not Animal House. We want people to, you know, have, make friends, but we want people also to be good students in this place. And I think architecture can make a difference in these things and whether or not they perform academically or not. So a year after the building was open, we did a post-occupancy analysis. And we asked several questions like, how do you feel about the friendships you might have formed during the year that you've lived at 2400 Noasis? And 44% of all of those questions said, my friendships are better than they were before I moved here. Now these are upperclassmen, they've been at UT for a while, uh, but 44% of them said their friendships are better when they live in 2400 Noasis. 50% said they're the same, but very few thought they were less good. Has your GPA changed in the year that you've lived at 2400 Noasis? And this is significant that 26% uh, said their GPA went up. 60% stayed the same, but 26% had their GPA go up. Compared with other places you've lived in college, would you say that 2400 Noasis makes my life better or the same or not as good? 67% said it made it better. Uh, a lot said that it was the same. Some had only ever lived there because they were transfer students. But, uh, you know, very, very high level of satisfaction. And of the 132 people who completed the questionnaire, every one of them said they would recommend living there for their friends. Now, that's what I think architecture is about doing. It's about making people's lives better, helping them make friendships better, helping them improve their GPA, helping them achieve the goals they want to achieve. Okay, so how does this impact learning? Uh, so here are two learning environments we've done recently. And uh, you know, it's just, I, I can't tell you how much fun it is to, um, to do learning environments when you're an educator. I mean, this is like as good as it gets for me. Um, so this is a, a little elementary school in East Austin. And this is kids who are in a disadvantaged neighborhood. It's a charter school, so they don't have rules. Like if we were doing this for Austin Independent School District, believe me, there are 10 zillion rules for how you make a school. And honestly, they don't make very good schools. In my estimation, they don't make very good schools. They especially don't make very good schools for the 21st century and for the kind of kids that are in this neighborhood and are trying to learn. And that's exactly what the teachers here thought. So we worked with the teachers for a year, uh, trying to understand how do you want to teach, what kind of place would you like to have. And so this is a school that is not a long corridor with a whole bunch of equal spaces around. The whole school is like a little village. The teachers said, I'd like for our kids to feel like they're at home. You know, not, not like they've gone somewhere where they're cooped up in school. We want a place that's more relaxed and more like their home, because they're little bitty kids. They're like, you know, eight, nine, 10 years old. And we shouldn't be treating them like they're in some kind of institutional, what the teacher said, like prison. It shouldn't be like prison. It should be more like home. So we made a little village out of all of those classrooms. Uh, and inside, we don't have the teacher at the front and rows of students behind them. Uh, instead, the way the teachers teach in this school is very much project-based learning. So there are little clusters of areas where the kids can do their own projects. These are these adorable little tiny kids. I love these little kids. These little tiny chairs. And we made little tiny sinks that were down that low. And, uh, and we made all the windows down low for the little kids. Uh, lots of natural light in the classrooms, lots of serotonin production going on here. Uh, all of these sort of tempting materials, learning materials around that just books and toys and things the kids can, can learn with uh, right there informally in, in, in their environment. 
uh, and a kind of scale to it that's, you know, different than the normal school. Not institutional, but much more personal and much more homelike. Uh, they've been in that building about a year. They moved from portables to that building. Okay, that's an easy slam dunk. Uh, how, how hard is it to beat a portable? But uh, these kids are just like, oh man, this is so cool. And the teachers are all over there. Each classroom has an outdoor space as well as an indoor space. So that each of them has a little garden. Uh, they have a little, you can see in this slide, you see through that door, they're out on the deck there. And then immediately next to that is a little garden. So they're teaching indoors and outdoors. You're not cooped up in the room all day long. And you're ex able to experiment and actually dig in the dirt and plant things and grow things and have science that's connected to that. Uh, so it's really hands-on kind of teaching environment. But uh, an incredible opportunity to really rethink how do kids learn and how do we make uh, elementary school environments. And then at the other end of the learning spectrum, uh, this is the new medical school that we, uh, in my firm, we did the first four buildings in the medical school down the way over here. Uh, I was involved in the health learning building primarily. Uh, and this is that building. It's, it's meant to be a UT building. It's made of the same limestone. The rest of the campus is. We have that terracotta color. We couldn't afford the million dollar terracotta roof, but we have the, the, the colors of that in the, in the sort of orange sunshades and, and uh, other parts of the building. But really the thing that this was about was this was a start from scratch medical school. We'd never had a medical school at UT. And uh, we got all new faculty and all new deans and everybody's, so we have to try to make a community out of this. How do you make them work together? So we made everybody's paths cross in the same place. So we have what we call the social edge on the right there where it's this cascading stair that goes up all five floors in the building. Uh, and along that route, you see the students' areas and the faculty offices and the dean's office and the lecture halls, and so that everything's kind of apparent to you. And then as you come and go to the bathroom or to, the, to lunch or to your class, or you're gonna run into everybody else in that kind of social area. And just like that, people begin to know each other and, and have a sense of community. Uh, the dean told us immediately, man, I don't have to schedule appointments with the students. I see the students as I come and go to my office every day or go around in the building. Uh, the students got to know each other in a much more intensive kind of way. So it really built a sense of community around that social edge of the building. Uh, very different teaching environments here. Uh, this is a lecture hall. And yeah, you can use it in the normal lecture format as these people are using it there. But also halfway through the lecture, you can just wheel those chairs around and eight people can gather around a table here and they can use the whiteboard to mark on there and they can have a little group study thing and then they can wheel back around and join the bigger group uh, and have discussion of that. And they can send their uh, you know, material up to the screen at the top and uh, it's all completely interactive, both with technology and, and uh, in a more rudimentary way as well. Uh, so, completely different way of teaching there. Uh, all the north side of the building is glass and looks out to these eight beautiful heritage live oak trees that we had on the site. So there's that connection to nature and all the way along there, there are terraces on every floor. So you can study outside, you can study inside, you can have that committee meeting outside, you can have that committee meeting inside. Uh, but I think a, just a different attitude toward health. Uh, all that stairwell was to encourage people not to take the elevator. It's a five-story building. Uh, and we've got an elevator, of course. But the idea is that there's that beautiful, enticing stair. And I will guarantee you 90% of the vertical movement there happens on that stair because it's there and it's beautiful and you're looking out to the trees and there's natural light. Uh, and that makes you a lot healthier than taking that elevator and not getting that exercise. Stairs are one of the very best exercise you can do. If you just take the stairs instead of an elevator, that just is constant, easy way to maintain 
a level of fitness. So there's all kinds of things in this building besides that. The indoor air quality, for example, we have no, uh, uh, we have it's greatly superior uh, air quality in that we've reduced the amount of formaldehyde in things like uh, the upholstery and the carpets and the hung acoustical tiles. We reduce the number of polycarbons so there's not off-gassing. So in terms of just respiratory health, in terms of fitness health, we're trying to make a healthy building in every regard. And also that connection to nature and indoors and outdoors. So um, we, I, I don't do many healthcare environments. My firm does, but I've only ever done two. And one of them was this one for the Chickasaw Nation, which uh, was really, uh, I loved working with these Chickasaw Indians. They're in the middle of freaking nowhere in Oklahoma, uh, but they use all their casino money to provide health care for their people. And they have universal health care. If you're a Chickasaw Indian, you just walk in, you get the health care taken care of, you don't pay anything, you don't, no paperwork, no nothing. You just show them your, Chickasaw card and everything is free and paid for by you and me gambling. Um, so there was an article that was gonna be written in uh, a publication about the building and the way that normally happens is, you know, uh, the author of who's ever writing the article calls you up as the architect and they interview you. Maybe they go to the building, maybe they don't even go to the building. Uh, they just take your bullshit and, you know, they revise it a little bit and then they make an article out of it. And I wish it were better than that, but it's not really. Um, so I knew that they were going to publish this and I, the other guy called me up and he talks to me for about 30 seconds and he's done. And I think, whoa, dude, that was, that was abrupt. Uh, what, where's he going to get any material for this? Well, he went to Ada, Oklahoma. And he sat around for two days in that healthcare center and he observed what happened there. And then he wrote this article based on that. So this is what he said. He said, the Chickasaw Nation Medical Center is in effect a compelling affirmation of the Chickasaw Nation's commitment to universal healthcare and the well-being of its people. It clearly provides a level of community engagement that heretofore has been virtually unheard of in hospitals. Said Page, that's our firm, clearly set aside the typical paradigms of hospital design protocol and instead invested their creative passion and humanity in creating the Chickasaw Nation Medical Center. The result of their work is a community health care center inextricably bound to its site, region, and local culture. This guy totally, I could not have written anything as clearly descriptive of what we were trying to do. Um, we looked really carefully at their weavings, at their basket work, and we made patterns in the building that were related to that to make it really make them see their cultural aesthetic predilections in the building. We also were thinking of these are all hospital rooms along there. And for one thing, every room's a little different and that's good. Uh, they all have a window that's for a vertical person. So when you stand vertically, that's where you see out the window and there are windows for people like that. But we also realize that when you're in the hospital, you're not a vertical person, you're a horizontal person. You're lying down in a bed and you don't see out the same way. And yet maybe you need to see out even more. So we put a high window in every single room where you can when you're lying down, you can see out and see the sky like that. Uh, so it was a combination of making that room for the person in the hospital bed as well as for their visitors and these patterns that made the window pattern that was there. We made it out of the materials that the Chickasaw had been building with for uh, a long time. They were the uh, Trail of Tears Indians, so they came from Mississippi to Oklahoma, but as long as they've been in Oklahoma, they've been building out of these local stones, and so a uh, great deal of the building is out of that stone. Tons of natural light everywhere in the building. Uh, these people are rural people. They're not accustomed to being cooped up, and, uh, and it drives them freaking nuts 
to be cooped up in a hospital room. So we made it so you can go outdoors everywhere. They're outdoor patios, and there are people there in their hospital gown and their drip walking around or being wheeled around out to the outdoors because they just want to, want to be outdoors. And even when you're moving around in the hospital, it's lots of views to the outdoors and lots of natural light. Uh, he also said in the article, all this attention to sunlight and nature views is more than mere aesthetic effect. It's a response to a deeply held Native American belief that nature requires our abiding respect and appreciation, and in return gives potent healing and nurturing. Dr. Judy Goforth Parker, Chief Administrator of the Chickasaw Nation Medical Center, grounds this belief in scientific fact. Clinical studies have proven that when patients have more views, nature decreases the need for medication. He got all that from Judy Goforth Parker. <laughs> You know, she, she knows her building's having an impact on the kind of health care they can deliver. I swear, if all hospitals were designed with the attitude that architecture can make life better, we would all heal better in hospitals. I believe that. We would heal better when we're in hospitals. Uh, I'm going to close off here just with a whole series of uh, projects we've done that are about helping people interact in a public space. Uh, and we're all over this. Uh, this is maybe my favorite thing, is trying to design environments where you know, people are just friendly and happy and interactive in public spaces. We've been working on the Austin Bergstrom International Airport for since uh, 1999 was the first phase completed, but we were working on it in 1995 on. Uh, we just recently did this addition which is a bunch more T, uh, TSA screening. But all the way through this airport, it's really about making a place that doesn't feel congested and crowded and nasty like many airport spaces do. The baggage claim area is big and airy and open. Uh, the TSA space is not, you don't feel like you're being funneled into a, a coffin. Uh, to do it, and, and lots of natural light. There's all the way through the building, lots of expression of Austin. This is a topographical map of central Texas, and uh, it's there just to see as kind of texture and color and architecture. But also, if you look a little closer, you can see the city of Austin and how it relates to the Colorado River, and you know, it's, it's got a little bit of the lore of the place in it. Other places, we have murals on the floor in the terrazzo, uh, that have to do with the history of Austin and glyphs and carvings in the wall and artwork. Uh, on the lower floor of this building is the uh, area where you go through customs. Uh, we did a huge transformation in the way customs works. It's always seemed crazy to me that when you come into the country, first you go through immigration and they check your passport. And then you get your luggage and then you go through customs and they check your bags. Why is this a two-step process? Why don't you just have one step that takes care of everything? So in Austin, if you come in from London or Frankfurt or Mexico, which you can do now, it's a one-stop shop. Instead of two steps, it's only one step. That enabled us actually to save a lot of space because there's all that queuing because you dump off an airplane and everybody all at the same time are going through customs. No, this way, you slowly get your bag. When you get your bag, you go through customs, so we don't have to have a big queuing area because slowly people get there as they get their luggage. I think a big improvement just on how do you operate so it's not nearly so annoying uh, to go through immigration and customs. Beautiful piece of art on the wall over there by Mick Young Kim, a Los Angeles artist. Uh, integration of the art into the environment. Uh, but that one-stop shop way of doing it. Again, can we in these public interactive places, can we make lives better by simplifying? Can we make it easier to get to your gate? Easier, more convenient to go to the bathroom, find your book or magazine, uh, go through customs. Can all those things in public spaces be easier? And then we've had this uh, wonderful opportunity to work on two wonderful projects in Houston, Discovery Green, uh, which is this big park in downtown Houston, all about kind of uh, a new interactive space for downtown. Uh, it's 10 years old now. We're hugely proud of the success 
of Discovery Green than we later did Buffalo Bayou Park, uh, which uh, of course had the challenge of it had to withstand hurricanes and flooding. And sure enough, a uh, year after it was finished came Hurricane Harvey, maybe the biggest test you could possibly get. But we built the whole thing knowing there are going to be hurricanes in Houston, Texas. Of course there will, why not? Uh, and so this is right on Buffalo Bayou, uh, but you can see that the building is all well up above the floodplain there, and the water did not get in any of the habitable areas. We were completely safe, although we're right by freaking Buffalo Bayou. We still were completely safe in Hurricane Harvey. Uh, all of it is made out of these very stout concrete I mean, this area is in the floodplain. And in Harvey, that one was, the, the water was up to about there. But that's fine. It's board-formed concrete. That just adds a little patina uh, to that board-formed concrete. And we had to have it so if, if a log is being catapulted down the water and it runs into that pier, it's got to withstand that. And it did. And it's fine. Uh, but you build it so it's resilient. So when horrible things happen, hey, it can take care of that. Uh, and all the way through the park, that's the ethic that we used. Uh, so this wonderful little restaurant, the Dunlavey, uh, allows the flooding to happen with no damage whatsoever. Uh, and then you're up in the treetops and you've got these beautiful views all around. Uh, and then we also discovered in this project a cistern that had supplied water for the entire downtown Houston area and had done that for decades, but then it sprung a leak and it was decommissioned and it was just sitting there disused. And they already had a contract to bulldoze it and get rid of it. And uh, they were gonna give the land, cause it was owned by the water department, they were gonna give the land to be part of Buffalo Bio Park. We thought, fantastic, that's great. Let's go out and check it out. Well, we checked it out and when we got there, we found that's what that cistern looked like. Well, not exactly like that because we fixed it up, but it was this amazing 32 feet deep, uh, a football field and a half uh, in breadth. And that was where the water was stored for downtown Houston. Now they were gonna bulldoze that and, and with no, don't do it. Uh, and so we preserved this space and it now is, uh, have any of you been to the cistern in Houston? Well, you guys have got to get your ass over to Houston and go to the cistern. Uh, part of the time, they use it as an educational device and you have to get reservations and you have to get them well in advance and they're booked solid. But it's, for one thing, just awesome to go into the cistern. But there's a little 20 minute tour through it where you learn about water in Houston. Water for flooding, uh, water for drinking, uh, water because that's where, why Houston is where it is, because of the ship channel. It was water and transportation that made that city where it is to begin with. And the whole history of water in Houston and water conservation, water as a resource, you're hearing about it in a place that is built for water. Uh, and there are thousands of school kids who go through this uh, every month. And, uh, and then sometimes it's shut down and we have big art exhibitions in there. There was a fantastic show by a, uh, a light and sound show by an artist from South America that was there for six months and was just an incredible experience. But uh, also a part of Buffalo Bayou Park. Then we've done the same thing here in Austin. We're really into public spaces. The Second Street District, which was really the kind of engine that started this redevelopment of downtown Austin, uh, you know, by making buildings and shopping and living and working all mixed use and work together, you then make an environment where people can have this really great life, everyday life, not just the special occasions, but everyday life. Uh, I live downtown in Austin. Oh, it's fantastic to be able to walk five minutes to my architecture office. There are 14 restaurants within two blocks of my house. Uh, the mothership of Whole Foods is one block one direction. Trader Joe's is one block the other direction. Uh, best movie theater ever, Violet Crown. A uh, little art theater is four blocks away. I mean, it's, all of this is that sort of 
Can architecture make life better? Can architecture give us alternatives we haven't had before? Can architecture help us not commute two hours to work every day, but live and work in the same? Of course, architecture can be this tremendous device for making life better. I think I'm probably over time, but uh, with that, I'll open it up for questions. Thank you.